What is the Gospel of Matthew all about? How does he tell his account of Jesus' life? And how do we get a big picture handle on the entire Gospel? I'm going to explain all that and more in this video. So grab a cup of coffee and let's take a deep drink from the Gospel of Matthew. Hmm. I lied. So we're going to have to change this out. Nothing like a nice hot drink on a really cold day outside. And having lived in England for five years, I can safely say that tea counts as a caffeinated drink. Welcome to the channel. If you're new here, this is the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and the goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminaries around the United States and the world and bring it to you on YouTube. So if you like these videos, please subscribe. That helps me a great deal. Give it a thumbs up and then hit that little share button and send it to someone you know. It doesn't cost you anything, but it'll help spread the word of the channel. So thank you very, very much. Today we're looking at the Gospel of Matthew, the entire Gospel and how the whole thing fits together. You could do this with an outline. An outline is great for putting a lot of the details about a book into one organized whole. But when you look at an outline, you have to read it. It just doesn't jump off the page at you. This is where using graphics really helps us to communicate a lot of information very quickly. Graphics can be very simple and very creative at the same time. Take a look at these 3D representations of letters. I bought this when my grandkids were little and learning their letters. The other benefit of graphical representation is that they capture our attention. My grandkids loved this book and wanted to look at it every time they came over. Take a look at the world around you. How much information do you see that is graphically represented? If you look at a map or a smartphone or show a graph on the spread of COVID or how effective vaccines are, all this can be represented graphically. Today, what I'm going to do is create an infographic that hopefully illustrates how Matthew's gospel is organized, structured, and flows. And I'll include a link below to a Dropbox account so you can download the final form of this graphic for your own use if you would like. First, a quick disclaimer. Most of the ideas and the content in this video are not new to me. I'm taking what others have done and trying to present it in a concise graphical representation. Five cycles. Ever since the early church, interpreters have seen Matthew's gospel organized around five main sections. You can call them divisions or whatever. I'm going to call them cycles because they each cycle through a similar pattern. Each of these five cycles consists of a section of Jesus' actions followed by a few chapters on his teachings. Many think that Matthew organizes gospel around these five cycles to sort of echo the five books of Moses. This idea was first put forward around 100 AD by Papias, a view that many still hold today. I think that there's some merit to this, but it's really hard to prove right out of the text of Matthew's Gospel itself. Doing biblical interpretation is a lot like detective work. You have to look for the clues and see where they are leading. Now, one of the clues that Matthew left behind for us is a very unique phrasing that he uses five times in his Gospel. Our English Bibles translate this along the lines of, when he had finished speaking, or now when Jesus had finished. And this phrase occurs in Matthew 7, 28, 11, 1, 13, 53, 19, 1, and 26, 1. The problem is, is that sometimes the English translators change the wording of these verses to fit the context in which they're found a little bit better. But in the Greek, the exact same wording is used in each passage, kai egeneto hate eltelesen. The Net Bible even includes a note for each one of these phrases that are found in Matthew. And it reads, the Greek reads, and it happened when. The introductory phrase, kai egeneto, it happened that, is redundant in contemporary English and has not been translated. So they let you know right off the bat how they have translated this phrase differently in each case. These five verses serve as transitions that move us from one section to the next. They both look back, and when he had finished, and forward to the phrase that is coming right after these clauses. So, for example, in 11.1, when it reads, When Jesus had finished instructing his disciples, 
he went on from there to teach and preach in their towns. So this transition statement at 11.1, when Jesus is finished, not only concludes the previous section, but it leads us into what Jesus is going to do next. These five transitional statements move us from one to the next in Matthew's Gospel, and they help us to organize his Gospel. So for now, where these are, I'm just going to put a red line on the chart for the sake of simplicity, because we're going to need a lot more information. In my last video, I asked the question of what is a gospel? How are they similar or different from other ancient biographies or historical accounts? And in that video, I mentioned that the gospel authors employed some of the same features as these other works. Actually, they employed a lot. And in particular, how Luke used a standard Greco-Roman prologue in his gospel. All four gospels have a prologue to their gospel. Well, Mark's is incredibly short, maybe one verse at best but they all really start their account of Jesus' life and ministry with his baptism by John. This occurs in Matthew 3, 1 through 3. In those days, John the Baptist came into the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Let's mark out how Matthew 1 through 2 serves as the prologue. I'm going to put this in pink. For the sake of this chart, I'm going to label this as the intro because I can't fit the word prologue in my little pink box here. Using Matthew's transitional statements, let's go back and roughly block out the remaining sections. Chapter 3 through 7 is the first cycle. 8 through 10 is the second cycle. 11 through 13, the third cycle. The end of chapter 13 through 18 is the fourth cycle and then chapters 19 through 25 is the fifth cycle. So what happens after chapter 26? Well, this leads us into Jesus' final meal, betrayal, arrest, crucifixion, and resurrection, sort of the last 24 hours of his life. This section doesn't fit with the patterns that we saw in the five cycles. And it's also set off by Matthew's use of the transitional phrase, now when he had finished. The other thing to notice is that I've made it the same color as the intro or the prologue. Why? Because many of the themes introduced in the prologue are picked up in the conclusion again. For example, in the prologue we have Jesus coming from the line of David, and in the conclusion we see Jesus enthroned as a king. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. In the prologue you have Mary becoming pregnant before being married, a very difficult situation for her and Joseph. And in the conclusion, she's present to watch her son be crucified. In the prologue, we have Herod the Great attempting to kill the infant Jesus. In the conclusion, Jesus is crucified, but he overcomes this with his resurrection. In the prologue, we have the Gentile Magi coming to worship Jesus. And then in the conclusion, we have the command to go to all the Gentiles and teach them all that Jesus commanded us. Word and Deed Let's go to those five cycles. Now, I mentioned that each of these follow a similar pattern of a few chapters where Jesus' actions are collected together and then a couple chapters or one of all of his teachings gathered together. So let me show you how this works out. In the first cycle, chapters 3 through 7 open with Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist, then quickly moves to his temptation in the wilderness in chapter 4. Matthew then records Jesus' first preaching in Galilee in 4, 12 through 17. But all that we really have for teaching in this section is repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, 4, 17. Then Jesus challenges his first four disciples to follow him in 4, 18 through 20. At the very end of chapter 4, we have a summary statement that talks about Jesus' healing ministry, how he went throughout Galilee teaching and healing all sorts of illnesses. As a result, large crowds followed him. A collection of Jesus' deeds in chapters 3 through 4. Now notice the change in Matthew 5. Matthew switches from what Jesus did to what he taught. The focus is now on his words. And in chapters 5 through 7, we have the Sermon on the Mount, which ends with, guess what? That's right, Matthew's transitional statement. And now when he had finished saying these things, in 728. The rest of the gospel follows this pattern, a collection of Jesus' deeds followed by a collection of his teachings. Chapters 8 through 9 are Jesus' deeds. 
chapter 10 is Jesus' instructions to his disciples when he sends them out two by two. Then we have a transitional statement to two chapters of Jesus' deeds in chapters 11 through 12. This reaches a climax with an extended collection of Jesus' parables in chapter 13. All of these parables are focused on the kingdom of God. And notice how this collection of parables in chapter 13 falls just about at the dead center of the gospel. Matthew really wants you to see that one of the big themes in his gospel is that Jesus is not only king, but the kingdom of God is dawning, and this is how we are to live our lives. We then move into the fourth cycle at the end of chapter 13. Chapters 14 through 17 is a collection of Jesus' deeds, and then chapter 18 is an extended collection of Jesus' teachings once again. The focus of this section is on the relationships of those within the kingdom of God. Not to those outside in the world, but to those who are members of the kingdom, and how they should behave and treat one another. This moves us into the final cycle, five chapters on Jesus' departure from Galilee and his journey to Jerusalem. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem occurs in chapter 21, and this signals the beginning of Jesus' last week on earth. Most of Jesus' interactions and debates with others within these chapters involve questions about the end of time. And you can understand, because Jesus' time on earth is coming to an end, and the disciples are going to want to know what happens after the kingdom dawns. This section closes with his disciples coming up to him while he's sitting on the Mount of Olives, and they say, Tell us when these things will happen, and what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age. This then segues to Jesus' apocalyptic discourse on the difficulties the disciples will face and surprisingly, almost half of this discourse is composed of parables, but this time they are about God's judgment and how we are to live our lives in light of that, not about the kingdom of God like we had in chapter 13. While Jesus' actions or miracles are almost totally absent from the discourse section, there are some extended teachings in Jesus' action sections. For example, in John 22:41, a Pharisee asks him, whose son the Christ is? And then you have Jesus' response. Then most of chapter 23 is Jesus' condemnation of the religious leaders. I guess you could include that as part of the fifth discourse, but the difference is that these sections are tied to the actions and the movements of Jesus where he is at that moment. While the discourse sections are not really tied to where Jesus is or what he is doing, you can kind of lift them out as separate sermons from the rest of the gospel. But the tone and the content of it is different than Jesus' teachings in chapters 24 and 25. So what can we say about these five discourse sections? First, they're not really tied to where Jesus is or what he is doing at that moment in the narrative. They might have an introduction to them. For example, with the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes up and sits down on the side of the mountain and begins to teach. But that's the last reference to where he is or what he is doing until the sermon is over. As a result, these five discourse sections can be taken out of Matthew's Gospel and seen as extended sermons by Jesus. This is why, ever since St. Augustine called chapters 5-7, through seven, the Sermon on the Mount, it is stuck. Matthew has really collected and put this forward in the form of a sermon. Relationship to Mark In my video on who copied who, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, and I'll have a link up here or underneath this video in the show more section if you're interested, I mentioned how 75% of Mark's Gospel is found in Matthew's Gospel. So how does that play out in this graphical depiction of Matthew's Gospel? Well, it's rather interesting. First, the material in chapters 1 and 2 of Matthew's Gospel are not included in Mark's Gospel at all. The vast majority of chapters 3 to 10 in Matthew's Gospel are not included in Mark either. Or if they are, they are in very abbreviated form. For example, in Jesus' temptation, Mark tells us that the Spirit drove Jesus out into the wilderness where he was tempted, and he was there for 40 days. But that's about it. In Matthew, the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness where you have the dialogue with the tempter and the three temptations before he returns back to civilization. It's not until chapter 12 that Matthew really starts to follow the content and the order of Mark's Gospel. 
that is, given that Matthew still uses these cycles of word and deed. But as a whole, from chapter 12 forward, Matthew follows Mark's gospel in order and content. Finally, and drum roll please, we have the 800 pound gorilla in Matthew's gospel that we need to give some attention to. Peter's confession in Matthew chapter 16. This is one point where almost every scholar agrees that Peter's confession is a major turning point within Matthew's gospel. This occurs in the town of Caesarea Philippi on the very northern fringes of the region of Galilee, possibly Gentile territory. While there, Jesus asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? Perhaps the crucial question Matthew wants us to be able to answer with his gospel. The disciples offer several answers until Peter chimes in, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God in 1616. This is the clearest and central statement of who Jesus is in Matthew's Gospel. And from a literary point of view, it marks a major shift in Matthew's narrative. Prior to Peter's confession, Matthew has focused on Jesus' ministry in the region of Galilee. After Peter's confession, Jesus turns his face towards Jerusalem. We can see this in 1621, where Matthew tells us, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Well, that's about all I have time for today and about as much information as I want to put in this one graphic. I hope this helps you see the overall flow, structure, and organization of Matthew's Gospel, and perhaps give you some ideas about how you could graphically illustrate a particular book that you're studying. As I mentioned earlier, I'll have a link down below to a Dropbox account where you can download this graphic if you would like to use it. Until next week, when we pick up with Matthew's Gospel once again, I will leave you with the word of peace. Don't forget, if you click on my face over here, that will see me to the channel. And over here, I'm going to have links to two videos that YouTube think you might want to watch next.